Hi everybody, it's Chris, and today we're reading chapter 26 of Stargirl. Usually, I saw her in the courtyard before school, but that day I didn't. Usually, I passed her between classes at least once or twice before lunch, not that day. In fact, when I looked over her table, at, when I looked over to her table at lunch, there was Dory Dilson, as usual, but someone else was sitting with her. No Stargirl in, in sight. Coming out of the lunchroom, I heard laughter behind me, and then a voice. Stargirls. What do you have to do to get somebody's attention around here? I turned, but it wasn't her. The girl standing, grinning in front of me, wore jeans and sandals, had burnt red nails, and lipstick, painted eyes, finger rings, toe rings, hoop earrings. I could put my hand through, hair. I gawked as students swarmed past. She made a clownish grin. She was beginning to look vaguely familiar. Tentatively, I whispered, Star Girl? She, she battered her chocolatey eyelashes. Star Girl? What kind of name is that? My name is Susan. And just like that, Stargirl was gone, replaced by Susan. Susan Julia Carraway, the girl she might have been all along. I couldn't take my eyes off of her. She cradled her books in her arms. The sunflower canvas bag was gone. The rat was gone. The ukulele was gone. She turned around slowly for my open mouth, dumbstruck inspection. Nothing goofy, nothing different could I see. She looked magnificently. She constantly quizzed me about what other kids would do, would buy, would say, would think. She invented a, fict a fictitious person who she, who she, whom she called Evelyn Everybody. Would Evelyn like this? Would Evelyn do that? Sometimes she misfired, as with laughing. For several days, she was along on a laughing jag. She didn't just laugh, she boomed. Heads turned in the lunchroom. I was trying to work up the nerve to say something when she looked at Kevin and me and said, would Evelyn laugh this much? Kevin stared at his sandwich. I sheepishly looked, shook my head. The laughing stopped, and from that moment on, she did a perfect imitation of a sullen, pout-lipped teenager. In every way, she seemed to be a typical, ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill teenager, and it wasn't working. At first, I neither noticed nor much cared that the shunning continued. I was too busy being happy that, that she was, as I saw it, now one of us. My only regret was that we could not play the basketball season over again. In my mind's eye, I pictured her aiming her incredible zeal and, and energy exclusively at the electrons. We could have won games on her cheering alone. It was she who said it first. They still don't like me. We were standing outside the TV studio after school. As usual, people were passing by as if we weren't there. Her lip quivered. What am I doing wrong? Tears made her eyes even larger. I squeezed her hand. I told her to give it some time. I pointed out that the state basketball finals would take place in Phoenix that Saturday, and that would end the season and clear the way for her cheerleading crimes to be forgotten. Her mascara was muddy. I had seen her sad many times before, but always for something else. This was different. This was for herself, and I was powerless to help. I could not find it in me to cheer up the cheerleader. That night, we did homework together at her house. I ducked into her room to check out her happy wagon. There were only two stones in it. When I came to school the next day, there was something different about the buzz in the courtyard. The arriving students were milling about, some roaming at random, some in clusters, but, I, but as I approached, there seemed to be a distinct clearing around the palmetto. I wandered in that direction, and through the crowd, I could see that someone, Susan, was seated on the bench. She sat upright and smiling. She was holding a foot-long stick shaped like a claw on one end. Around her neck, dangling on a string, was a sign that read, Talk to me and I'll scratch your back. She was getting no takers. No one was, with it, was within 20 feet of her. Quickly, I turned away. I walked back through the crowd. I pretended I was looking for someone. I pretended I hadn't seen and prayed for the bell to ring. When I saw her later that morning, the sign was gone. She said nothing about it. Neither did I. Next morning, she came running at me in the courtyard. Her eyes were bright for the first time in days. She grabbed me with both hands and shook me. It's going to be okay. It's going to end. I had a vision. She told me about it. She had gone to her enchanted place after dinner the day before, and that's where the vision came to her. Had come to her. She had seen herself returning to triumph from the Arizona, returning in triumph from the Arizona State Oratorical Contest. She had one first prize, best in the state. When she returned, she got a hero's welcome. The whole school greeted her in the parking lot, just like in the assembly home. There were streamers and confetti and tooting kazoos and horns blaring and the mayor and city council were on hand and they had a parade right then and there and she rode high on the back seat of a convertible and held her winter silver plate up for all to see 
and the happy faces of her classmates flashed in a sparkling trophy. She told me this, and she threw up her arms and shouted, I'm going to be popular. The state contest was a week away. Every day she practiced her speech. One day she called over little Peter Sinkowitz and his playmates and presented the speech to us from her front steps. We applauded and whistled. She bowed grandly, and I, too, began to see her vision. I saw the streamers flying, and I heard the crowd cheering, and I believed. And now we have our questions for chapter 26 of Stargirl. Our first question is, why had Stargirl changed her name back to Susan and began acting like everyone else? Our second question is, how many happiness pebbles were in Stargirl's wagon after she became Susan?